Hello there, I'm Lord Theranis and welcome back to our journey through the lore of the Elder Scrolls. Now, I realise that this isn't the video I said was coming next in the previous episode, but I do have a good reason for that. I realised when I was prepping for the next stretch of videos that there was something I'd missed out that's really quite important to understanding the lore of Tamriel in proper context, and that's the eras into which Tamriel's history is stratified. Without understanding those, it's really quite hard to figure out where events sit in the wider world of Tamriel, and see how small the timeline of the games we play actually is. So as always, please join me as we turn the pages of the Mysterium Xarxes. It's not unusual for fictional worlds with a large amount of background material to have their own version of the BC AD system, although since I'm a historian by education, I do prefer the BC and CE system. Star Wars, for example, stratifies its historical events around the Battle of Yavin 4. Things take place either BBY or ABY. The Elder Scrolls is no exception to that system. Tamriel's history is divided into six distinct eras. What's particularly interesting about these eras of history, though? is that the beginning of linear history isn't actually the beginning of historical events. If you cast your mind back to the early episodes of this series, where we discuss the formation of the Orbis, you'll remember that I referred to events like these and the machinations of Lorcan as the Dawn Era, and that's the first era of Tamriel's history. Although confusingly there is also a first era, that's in fact the third era in terms of historical placement. The Dawn Era is a period where the linear progression of time is no guarantee. Reality is malleable as a whole, and time apparently especially. As a result, the Dawn Era is a bit of a mess of events. They happen in a general assumed order, but the specifics are very much up in the air until we reach the meeting of the Aedra at the Adamantine Tower. That solidifies the progression of time and history into linear structures, and it marks the move from the Dawn Era into the first real era of Tamrielic history, the Marethic. Time might be linear in the Marethic era, but that doesn't mean that events are any more understood or explained. The Marethic era is the second longest and least understood of the true Tamrielic eras, and it's only really chronicled by people in the following eras looking at events in the same manner we would treat archaeology and myths. In fact, you count the years of the Marethic Era backwards, going down from around 2500 to the beginning of the First Era in Year Zero. The Marethic Era as a whole is very much the era of elves above anything else. Men don't even begin to appear until around the year 1000 ME, and whilst the important events of Eastgrim War's invasions of Skyrim and the Dragon War that drove out Alduin all happen in the Marethic Era, it's ultimately the establishment of the Cameron dynasty in Valenwood that marks Year Zero and the start of the First Era. The First Era of Tamriel is by far the longest of the eras, clocking in at around 3,000 years, and it's the point where we begin to see defined specific points of history in the lore. The Marathic Era has important historical events, but they're much more mythical in comparison to the clearly defined events of the First Era. Think of it like the Punic Wars when compared to the tales of Romulus and Remus. The First Era is where a lot of the founding events of basic Tamrielic civilization occur. It's when the Nords of Skyrim establish the High Kings, when the slave queen Alicia rises up against the aliens, and it's when the Battle of Red Mountain takes place, which leads to the disappearance of the Dwemer, if there's an important singular event referenced or remembered by a culture in Tamriel, there's good odds that event takes place in the First Era. Now there are far too many events as such to even try and go into detail about the First Era, but probably the most important to the progression of the eras are the Akaviri invasion of 2703, where the Riemann Empire was first formed from the ruins of the Elysian, 
and the resulting assassination of Riemann III in 2920, which led to the Saishi potentate Versa Duché taking over the reins of the empire for himself, and officially declaring the start of the Second Era. The Second Era of Tamriel is somewhat the odd one out when it comes to the numbered eras. Comparatively few important backstory events happen in the Second Era compared to the First, but at the same time, all the events that contribute to the foundation of Tamriel as we experience it happen in its final years, and culminate in the Third Era being declared. This leaves the Second Era in a bit of an odd place, where its primary purpose in the lore is really to join up the Tamriel of the First Era with the Tamriel of the Third, without having any real long-lasting impactful historical events in and of itself. However, that's ended up as a blessing as much as a curse. You could divide the Second Era into two broad categories. The first half of the era is spent under the thumb of the Potentates, puppeteering the corpse of the Riemann Empire to make Tamriel dance to their tune. That ends in 2E430, with the assassination of Potentate Severian Chorak and his heirs, which ends the reign of the Zaishi and finally dissolves the Riemann Empire. This plunges Tamriel into a period where there is no single unified Tamrielic authority. It's known as the Interregnum. The Interregnum exists as a blank slate when it comes to law and history. It's a period of more than 400 years where effectively anything could have happened. This paucity of information, though, made the Interregnum the perfect setting for the Elder Scrolls Online, which has done an excellent job, in my opinion at least, of filling in the details missing from that period, while still not contradicting the overall lore of the successive games. Because eventually, no matter what happened in the Interregnum, we know that Tyra Septim will come. He will conquer Tamriel, completing it by 2E896, and he will then begin his own version of history, the Third Era. Now, the Third Era is probably the most familiar era to players of the Elder Scrolls games, as it's when the first four games in the main series are set, along with most of the spin-off games. The Third Era effectively comprises the rule of the Septim Empire over Tamriel. Perhaps because it's the era in which we play through, there are far fewer events of Tamriel-wide impact in the first several centuries of the Third Era. There's a civil war or two, multiple power struggles, and buckets upon buckets of courtly intrigue, but there's nothing quite on the scale of the Plain Melt or the Elysian Revolution. Not until we get to around 3E395, which is when the events of Arena and Battlespire start to take shape. Once that kettle of fish is opened though, you've pretty much got a world-threatening event every decade or so for the last 30 years of the era. The Emperor is freed from Jagartharn's clutches, the warp in the west changes the face of High Rock as we know it, Vardenfell is open for settlement and Dagothur finally defeated for good, and things finally culminate in 3433, with the assassination of Uriel Septim VII, and the invasion of Mechrun's Dagon and the forces of Oblivion. When that Oblivion crisis ends with the sacrifice of Martin Septim, the line of the Septims is finally ended and the so far shortest of the eras is brought to a close, as Tamriel moves into the fourth era, where the most current game in the series takes place. The third era was a period of distinct unity among the races of Tamriel, despite the strife that the Empire faced at times during it. The fourth era, on the other hand, is very much about that unity fracturing, and Tamriel splitting back into its component provinces. The Elder Council tries to keep order and keep the Empire intact, but it's not long before things start coming apart at the seams. The Red Mountain erupts after the moon of Bardal finally crashes into Vivek City, devastating the lands of Morrowind. The Argonians take this opportunity to secede from the Empire and invade their ancestral enemies while they're weakened. That happens within the first five years of the era, and things only get worse from there. They top things off with High Chancellor Akato, the leader of the Elder Council and probably the only figure keeping Tamriel together, being assassinated, which plunges the Empire into a complete constitutional crisis. By the time that Titus Mead takes control of the Imperial City seven years later, it's far too late to keep the Empire together. 
The Somerset Isle and Valen would secede, forming the Old Mary Dominion, and they declare the Great War on the Empire. When that war finally ends, with the Empire on the losing side, Hammerfell refuses the terms of surrender, and splits from the Empire to fight the Dominion on its own terms. Finally, 200 years after the death of Martin Septim, Skyrim is plunged into a civil war of its own, when Ulfric Stormcloak murders its High King and sets out to secede from the Empire in his Stormcloak Rebellion. And that is the state that Skyrim finds itself in 4E201, when an unknown stranger tries to cross the border into Skyrim and finds themselves caught in the middle of an Imperial ambush aimed at capturing Ulfric Stormcloak. You, finally awake. You were trying to cross the border, right? Walked right into that Imperial ambush, same as us, and that thief over there. The eras are very important to understand properly when exploring the laws of the Elder Scrolls, not least because they do provide that date system by which we place events. By understanding at least the basics of each era and the events that take place in them, we make it much easier to place events in their proper lore context. A mass battle or an inherited struggle in the 14th century, for example, is very different from the same thing in the 18th century, and the same principle applies to Tamriel's history. By recognising not just the events that the game's developers have created, but also the context and history they've put them in, I feel like that helps us to properly understand just how much effort has really gone into keeping these games feeling like a living world. But that brings me to the end of today's episode. If you've enjoyed my stories today, please do give a video a like and subscribe to my channel. Next time, we'll be following up on that in-depth look of Tamriel I promised. We'll be exploring Skyrim and its indigenous Nords looking at their history, culture, and the geography of Skyrim itself. Until then though, thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next time.